الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان ليوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you to another session from commentary of the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah and with the fadl of Allah we are on hadith number 30 and this topic is on transgressing the limits and let's begin the recitation عن أبي ثعلب الخشني جرتم بن ناشر رضي عن عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الله تعالى فرض فرائد فلا تضيعوها وحد خدودا فلا تعتدوها وحرم أشياء فلا تنتهكوها وسقط عن أشياء رحمة لكم غير نسيان فلا تبحثوا عنها حديث حسن رواه دار قطني وغيره Translation. It was narrated on the authority of Abu Ta'ala Bal Khushani Jurtum bin Nashir Radhu'an that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily, Allah the Most Highest prescribed the obligatory deeds, so do not neglect them. He has set certain limits, so do not transgress them. He has forbidden certain things, so do not indulge in them. And He is silent about certain things as an act of mercy to you. Not out of forgetfulness, so do not go about inquiring into these. And this is narrated by Ad-Dar Qutmi and others. Now what we said this hadith is a Hasan hadith. So as is our tradition, we're going to go into some points about the life of this narrator of this hadith, of hadith number 30, which is about you know, staying in your lane, in a sense. The narrator is Abu Tha'laba al-Khushani, Jurtum bin Nashir, who it from this collection, obviously we don't know much about them. So we can, inshallah, gain our knowledge. And this Sahabi, he was present in Bayatul Ridwan and was given spoils from the Battle of Khaybar. Okay. And he was sent to his people uh, by the Prophet ﷺ who said, go to your people and invite them to Islam. And indeed, the Sahabi came back with a group of people who had accepted Islam, subhanAllah. And later on, after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, he moved to Sham and you know, there are many who narrate hadith from the Sahabi, and these include important and very high tabi, followers of the Sahaba, which include the figures such as Abu Idris al Khawlani and Sa'id ibn Musayyib. These are very eminent tabi'un, among others as well, who narrate from him. And for example, Abu Muslim al Khawlani, we discussed or we mentioned him briefly, but he is a well known tabi and was actually one of the very prominent religious figures in Sham, in Damascus. And he was one of the eight known ascetics, who include also the likes of Amir ibn Abdul Qais, Owais al Qarani, Al Rabi al Khutaym, Al Aswad ibn Yazid, Masruq ibn Al Ajda, Sufyan al Thawri, and Ibn Sa'id, and also Hassan al Basri. So these are very eminent Tabi'un, and this example that many of the great figures. They basically took their knowledge from the Sahaba, the big ones that we know of, and also of the other Sahaba, like the likes of Abu Ta'ala, al Khushani, and others who we don't know much about. So there's many lesser known Sahaba who also exerted their most in terms of working for the deen. They have a hand in, alhamdulillah, the fact that we are guided. May Allah be pleased with them. Anhum. Going forward, lessons from this hadith. And this hadith is actually regarded as da'if from notable muhadditin such as Bukhari, Imam Ahmad, and Al-Hatim. Okay. And there are three main causes for its defectiveness, which are the following. So this is just into a glimpse into the Mustalah hadith. And we talked briefly about certain aspects of Mustalah hadith. This is not a course on Mustalah hadith or the science of hadith, but it's important to know as you gain more knowledge into this beautiful science, da'if, as we mentioned before, is put into a category with those which are fabricated hadith. So this is important. That's why Taif hadith, they can be used for Islamic rulings. So in terms of just looking at the reasons for its defectiveness, there's actually three reasons why this hadith is Taif. 
Okay, number one, okay, Makul did not hear the hadith from Abu Thalaba himself. The scholar said that even if he heard from Abu Thalaba al Khushani, he was classified among those who committed tadlis. And what's tadlis? Tadlis is when a person narrates a hadith upon one of his teachers, but he did not hear the particular hadith which he is narrating directly from his teacher, but via an intermediate source. And this is indicated by the term an. Okay, so even though we hear the word an frequently, often this can indicate that there is some tadlis going on, on the authority of, which makes it weak. It would not have been weak if a term such as indicating sama or direct hearing was used, such as for example, akhbirni or sama'tu. Okay, those terms indicate that there's no doubt that I heard or someone informed me that something, something that the Prophet said that. These finer details are important in terms of the sciences of hadith. For example, ijazah cannot be done through a recording because the scholar or the one who is presenting the hadith has to give permission for that transmission to even happen. So, the, the, this does happen very frequently even in our this day and age as well. But in terms of during that time when things were not on like videotape or audio, when sometimes there was scarcity of writing material as well, and particularly during the early age when not all the hadith were transmitted were written down. This happened sort of a little later even though there was transmission of hadith and some of the companions did record the hadith on paper. Much of the tradition initially was oral and it was soon written down and recorded on paper. And number three, that this is, there's a contention that this actually was not a hadith, but a saying of the companions of the Prophet So there's three reasons for the hadith being weak. Obviously the third one was the most problematic possibility. So this is a da'if hadith, so what do we do about that? So this is perhaps a good tangent to briefly discuss some points about da'if hadith. In terms of collection of ahadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, most of the ahadith actually are da'if. So what do we do? I mean, how do we utilize them? So the scholars, the ulama have three different viewpoints regarding the hadith which are da'if. Okay, the first view is that a weak hadith has no value and should not be followed. Okay, and this is actually a very strong opinion, particularly of the muhaddithin. So this is in regards to weak hadith which cannot be elevated by other supporting hadith or hadith to the level of hasan. So you may have a weak hadith, but because of other supporting hadith or different narrations which have a complete change, for example, or support in other ways, then the da'if hadith becomes elevated to hasan. Yani hasan li ghayrihi. Hasan from another outside source, outside this hadith itself. So it can have supporting material to elevate it. And this is basically a work of the ulama, particularly the muhaditun, because not every scholar can do that. I mean, you need like really an expansive knowledge of a hadith. So leading ulama such as Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Yahya bin Ma'in and others hold on to this first view that a weak hadith has really no value and should not be followed. Okay. Number two, the second view is that acting on a weak hadith is preferable to acting on personal opinion or ra'i. And this is in regards to those ahadith whose weakness is slight and has harmony and is in concert with certain accepted principle of Islam and there's nothing gharib or strange in it. And furthermore, this hadith is not, cannot be made the basis of anything related to aqidah. Okay, so a weak hadith, you can use it if it's not too weak, not anything which is contradictory in terms of other Islamic principles. And it has nothing to do with aqidah, which is the fundamentals of Islam. And yet there's a third opinion which that a weak hadith may be followed in moral virtues, but not in legal injunctions or hakam. And this opinion is also feared by many fuqaha. So, daif hadith, you can't use it for legal rulings. Okay? You should avoid using it if you have other hadith which are authentic, sahih or hasan the hadith can be corroborated by another hadith to elevate its status and that's good then you can then utilize it more so these are the three opinions and you see that you can't use it as a fatwa 
hadith, which is weak, cannot be used as a fatwa, cannot be used for legal injections, cannot be used for aqidah. These are very important things to know because most of the tradition of the Prophet actually are weak, particularly often with the chain. Down the road, inshallah, we'll look at sahih hadith and what makes hadith sahih, inshallah, as well. Muqaddimah. So despite the weakness of the chain of this hadith, it is important to know that the overall meaning from the matan, from the text of the hadith is sound and acceptable. The Maliki jurist Ibn Arabi said, this hadith is one of the most important rulings in Islam and should be known to every Muslim. Furthermore, despite its weaknesses, this hadith was accepted by Imam Nawi in his collection. Okay. You have to note that, and you'll see that Imam Nawi, he's a bit more lenient in terms of the Sahih and the Daif, because there's a couple of other hadith in this collection which are weak. So here, even though he said it's Hassan, it's really not Hassan because of the fact that uh, there's some problems with one of the narrators, Makul, in terms of looking at it more detailed. Going forward, so what Sussam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فَرَضَ فَرَائِدْ فَلَا تُضَيِّعُوهَا So the Prophet ﷺ says, Verily Allah, the Most High has prescribed the obligatory deeds, so do not neglect them. And here, faraid means all those things which have been made obligatory from the Qur'an. And this is why scholars have said that the farad is higher than the wajib. And this is from the angle that what Allah has, subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated is called the farad in the Qur'an. Whereas, for example, in the Hanafi school, that which is obligated from the hadith is called wajib. Okay. I mean, some madhabs is basically, there's no differentiation, but there is, as per some ulama, Okay. However, in both cases, we have to obey them in what is obligated in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. At the end of the day, basically, they're both obligated, but of course, the Qur'an has a higher status, and this is where some ulama have labeled the obligatory deeds from the Qur'an as farud versus those which uh, from the Sunnah as wajib. Then the Prophet says, وَحَدَّ حُدُودًا فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا Okay, so staying in your lane. This hadith mentions that anything outside the limit of the sharia is not halal and will displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's so many people who transgress the bounds because they find pleasure in doing certain evil actions. Okay, just because of that, not being able to control themselves, not being able to control their desires. And yet, because they couldn't restrain themselves, they find at the end, the severe punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon them. Because they could not control those desires, and just for a few moments, just for pleasure, ma'adullah, they find the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. hududan fala ta'taduha. So, he has prescribed the limits to do not transgress those limits. So, had can also refer to the punishment for a crime, and often these are very severe, so they go hand in hand. For example, for theft, for zina, for taking the life of someone, these are severe crimes, and they, uh, the punishment for these are also severe as well. So here, um, Dr. Jamal Badi, the author of this commentary on the 40 Hadith, he also mentions that had many people transgress in terms of the limits regarding mu'amalat, and particularly with regards to those who are close to them. Often they're good with other people, like friends and the people of the community, but within their own homes, unfortunately, they cause transgression and oppress and go beyond the bounds. Like, for example, against their wife, there's abuse, or against certain family members, because they think that there's, they can get away with it, or it's okay. okay. But in the end, because of these transgressions, they will suffer the bad consequences of the evil they caused. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also shown us that it's important not to transgress the bounds in terms of mu'amalat, in terms of our relationship with our loved ones and those who are close to us. It's so important. And Allah Sumat has mentioned this, for example, in Surah Ibrahim, where he says, إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And never think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what the wrongdoers do. He only delays them for a day when the eyes will stare in horror. 
is so unfortunate that adherence to Islam and the limits, particularly in mu'amalat, are lacking with respect to family relationships. Okay. And because of this, many evils result and effects occur. And this unfortunately is widely seen in the Muslims in their life as well, in their, in their personal life. For example, if you go to the court system, there's many cases where we see transgression and violation, particularly within the family, between husband and wife and whatnot. So, Islam is a practical religion and allows for some things to occur even if they are disliked. This is actually mentioned when talking about the relationship between husband and wife. The Prophet ﷺ states in a hadith, لا يفرق مؤمن مؤمنة إن كره منها خلقا رضي منها آخر أو قال غيره A believing man should not hate a believing woman. If he dislikes one of her characteristics, he will be pleased with another. And this is narrated by Abu Huraira in Al-Bukhari. So consequently, Islam tells us to have sabr and to appreciate be tolerant of others. Uh, be tolerant of someone's minor problems. Yeah, because you'll be pleased with another characteristic of your spouse or of your other family member. And no one's perfect. All of us have our vices. All of us have our Achilles heel in terms of our character. And we have to again strive towards being like Prophet Muhammad who is the perfect exemplar for us. And another common occurrence which happens in families is in divorce. Often the spouses are not in control of their emotions and they end up saying things which they do not intend. And from this, again, not being able to control things, it's not uncommon that this provokes the husband to pronounce talaq out of anger. Okay, may Allah protect us and our families allow us inshallah to gain increase in sabr and being more tolerant so Islam commands us to be moderate when it comes to dealing with people and also spouses should deal with each other in a moderate way one hadith says what the Prophet says Ahbib Habibaka Hawnan Ahbib Ahbib Habib Ahbib Habibaka Ahbib Habibaka Hawnan the Prophet says, Ahbib Habibaka Hawnan Ma Asa Ma Asa Yakuna Be Rodi Be Rodi Be Raid Be Be Bari Bari Baka Bari Bari Baka Bari Baka Yoman Ma Abarid Bari Daka Yhunan Ma Asa Yakuna Habibaka Yoman Ma. The Prophet says, Love your beloved moderately. Perhaps he becomes hated to you someday. And hate whom you hate moderately. Perhaps he becomes your beloved someday. And this is narrated by Abu Huraira in Jamia Tirmidhi Hassan. So going forward in this hadith, then the Prophet says, وَحَرَّمَ شَا فَلَا تَنْتَهِكُوهَا Then he has forbidden certain things, then do not indulge in them. This hadith can be interpreted in three different ways which do not contradict one another. And this all points to the Jawami al Kalim of the Prophet. ﷺ. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fama atakum rasulu fahuduhu wa manahakum anhu fantahu. And whatever the messenger gives you, take it, and whatever he prohibits you, then leave it. And then he says, Allah wa atiyur Rasul and obey Allah and obey the messenger. So the tenets mentioned in this hadith have been actually used by the fuqaha as a way of categorizing rulings in the sharia. And it is actually from this hadith that the rules of the five well-known categorizations of halal and haram are derived. And these are the following. And we've discussed this. Number one, all actions that we do, whether it's dini or dunya, it can be categorized into one of five. Number one, things which are obligatory, wajib. Two, which are Mandub or mustahab, preferable. Number three, an action which is allowed and mubah. Number four, things which are disliked but not haram, which are makruh, and things which are haram, which are forbidden. Okay, so these are the five categories extracted from this hadith. And then the Prophet says, وَسَقَطَ عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ رَحْمَةً لَكُمْ غَيْرَ نِسْيَانِ okay, And he is silent about certain things as an act of mercy for you, not out of forgetfulness. So this is the rahmah of Allah Ta'ala. فَلَا تَبْحَثُ anha, And so do not go about inquiring into these matters. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has remained silent about matters by not making them haram. So here the silence is about the ruling of a matter. Okay, So do not be too inquisitive about things which he has not talked about 
great detail. So in conclusion, highlights from this hadith. This hadith has been included in the collection of Ba'un because of the important principles that he details and its meaning supported by various Quranic ayat. And this is the case despite it being a weak hadith. And we see that the concept of Allah's hudud, the limits, has special relevance also to family relationships and also legal bindings. Okay, so furthermore, family and spousal ties have been made sacred by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And breaking these ties leads to sin and leaves a destructive effect on society, particularly from the inner circle. And it's important that contemporary Muslim society learn from these lessons and be cognizant of Staying in your lane, particularly from in terms of the hudud of Allah and also again of hukuk al ibad, the rights of others as well. Because not doing so leads to upheaval from this transgression of the hudud. And if Muslims reflect on this hadith and, and other Quranic ayat related to this hadith, society will be uh, kept away from the evil and tribulation and they also will be kept away from the punishment and the humiliation in the akhirah. May Allah allow us to give us tawfiq from implementing this hadith. And also the other hadith from this collection. Subhanaka Allahu wa hamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant wa sakfaktubu wa ilayka salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.